to the Mike Joel Bear web show. Tonight we have something very different for you and something very exciting. We're here at the Bull Theatre here in London and we are filming as part of the Ultimate Drum Experience, which is a week-long drum camp, basically. Uh, tonight we're actually going to open the floor to the audience to ask questions to our three guests. So let me introduce you to them now. We have Bob Hedrett, uh, Jeff Dugmore on the end, and, well, this, this guy here. Uh, <laughs> uh, Mike Dolbert has decided he wants to be quizzed by the audience tonight. How are we all this evening? Excellent. Very well, thank you. Excellent. Yes. Excellent. That's, that's good. You look a bit nervous, Mike. Well, well, they look a bit, a bit worried about that lot, to be told. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, I'm going to answer my first question, because I feel we need to cut to the core of serious questions here. What's one of your most embarrassing moments while being in the career of drumming? Ooh. Who would like to start first? I've got one. We were playing in Bakersfield with the, with, it wasn't the Kinks, it was Argent, and we had, we'd gone all the way through the act. If you can picture 30,000 people waiting for the encore, um, and we hadn't played Hold Your Head Up, so we decided that we were going to leave it till the very end, and uh, Hold Your Head Up was our sort of claim to fame, that and God gave rock and roll to you. So we... Uh, we finished the show and it all went dark as it does before the encore and the road crew thought that we weren't going to go on anymore. They thought that was it. So they, they started to clear the gear away but they didn't get too far and there was only one piece of the drum kit that was uh, moved out. And so once the, they realised that we were going to do the encore, I went up and hold your head up in those days started with a flurry around the toms hit the gong, play, and the uh, and then start on the orchestral bass drum, bomb, diddy, bomb, diddy, bomb, diddy, bomb, ba, bomb, diddy, bomb, diddy, bomb, diddy, bomb, ba, sit down. Unfortunately, the stool oh, was the one piece God. that they, <laughs> now, now you can, you, I mean, all of the lights were on me, this was my big moment, and I sat <laughs> on the floor, and now you can't escape from that, nor can you get up that quickly from it, you know, so uh, that is, one of my most embarrassing moments, <laughs> in, in, a, in a word. Luckily, they did just replace the top then. Maybe uh, that would have been even worse, wouldn't it? Yeah, yes. <laughs> but there are, I've got more. <laughs> Every drummer's got more. Yeah. I, I'm just, I was just thinking about that there, and I think possibly one of the most sort of, uh, shall we say, kind of inopportune moment uh, uh, comments I ever made was during... Um, Hang on a minute. <laughs> You've got to turn your phone off, Mr. <laughs> 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 It's not mine. How do you know it's mine? <laughs> because everyone else's speech says off. <laughs> <laughs> what fun. Sorry about that. <laughs> Carry on, Jeff. <laughs> We're going to keep that bit in, I think. Moment right there. <laughs> <laughs> There's my new phone. Power off. <laughs> Don't work with children, uh, and, and animals, and Henry, and Henry. <laughs> But life is like that, isn't it? See how I'm, I'm not even embarrassed. I mean, that, that's, that's the worst thing about it, isn't it? I, <laughs> Sorry, Jeff. What was <laughs> Sorry, Jeff. I realised that. I think that was maybe one of your classic <laughs> embarrassing moments in the music industry. <laughs> Sorry about that. <coughs> Operator error. <laughs> Jeff, would anyway, you like to so try um, again? We're, uh, we'd been doing some writing and, and, and rehearsing with uh, Robbie Williams for his first solo album. And during the whole course of, the, of, of doing this, there, there had obviously been some uh, acrimonious uh, fallouts between him and the other guys in, the, in, the, in Take That at the time. And we go in to, to cut the, the first tracks for the, for the album. And we were doing this one particular song. It was really upbeat, really vibey. And... Everything was going great, and we came to the end of the song, and we were all really stoked and charged. And I jumped up from my drum kit and went, "Take that!" <laughs> and suddenly you realised, "Oh dear, that wasn't a very clever thing to say, was it?" <laughs> um, well, I can think of a few, and this could be one of the most embarrassing moments of my life. But I think one of the funniest ones was working with Jojo Mayer. And there's been lots of drummers, fortunate drummers, that I've worked with that. Um, there's been many funny stories, but Jojo, um, we were staying in Manchester, we were doing some shows in Manchester, and um, basically we checked into the hotel in the afternoon, we went to our rooms, and then when we were leaving, it was one of those hotels where you had like half a table hanging off the end of the key, so you have to give it in, because you can't, you know, 
you need a forklift truck to take it with you. So, <laughs> so we handed it over. Anyway, we went to the gig. Um, we came back and uh, I dropped Jojo off and uh, I had to go somewhere else. And I said, I'll see you back in 10 minutes. We'll meet up in the bar. So anyway, I come back to the, uh, to the, the, the reception and Jojo's still sitting in the foyer. And there was a very unhelpful uh, person sitting behind the desk. And I said, what's going on? And Jojo said, he won't let me into my room. He said, I'm not staying here. So um, I tried to have this conversation with this guy that was not happy. And he said, he's not on the system. I'm like, yeah, but we've checked in. You, you know, with all the gears in the room. Anyway, after about 10, 15 minutes, we finally convinced this, this person to take us up to, the, or up to Jojo's room and see that it's all Jojo's stuff. And he showed him his past and everything's done. So the next morning, <coughs> we, used, we had a lobby call at 12 o'clock midday. And um, I had gone off and done whatever, been for me run or whatever I had to do. And uh, I, at this particular day, um, I put everything in, in the motor and I came back in to meet Jojo, who was there with his bags, literally waiting. And he ran out the door. He says, come on, let's go. Let's, we've got to go. Let's go now. I'm like, all right, no, no, come on, let's just go. Quick, hurry up. We've got to go. And Jojo's pretty laid back and pretty cool. So it was like, well, what? He said, what's, I said, what's happened? He said, no, no, I'll tell you, I'll tell you in the motor. I'll tell you in the motor. So we get in the motor and he goes to explain that that evening he, he went upstairs to his hotel room and he put, he run a bath. It was about whatever, <laughs> half past midnight, one o'clock in the morning. He run his bath. He got onto his computer, put his headphones on and gets lost in whatever he's doing until for about a couple of hours. And then all of a sudden he hears this. Oh, yeah. And he's like, what? What's going on? <laughs> so he's, he sort of turns his headphones off and thinks, oh, oh, someone banging on the door. As he walks to the door, he's walking through water, okay, opens the door, and there's a gentleman in a bathrobe with plaster all over his head. <laughs> and he said, in, I can't use exact words, no, but, we get but basically, <laughs> I think you've left the bath running because the ceiling has just fallen down on the bed. I, he was laying in the room underneath him and in the bed, and apparently... <laughs> The, it, all the water filled up, but it collapsed. So Jojo opened the bath at the door and saw this water everywhere. There was no uh, soak away. So luckily, it was the hotel's responsibility. But then Jojo had to contact the same guy that wouldn't let him in his room and say, we need two more, more rooms. Because mine's <laughs> flooded and the guy's ceiling has come down from below. In. So there you go. There's my... Uh, that was pretty embarrassing. That's rock and roll. <laughs> <laughs> Spinal tap. I mean, I know people who did that on purpose. Well, yeah, he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Jojo didn't do it on purpose. Are you sure? Yeah, I don't have it. I won't have him back. That's it. He's been banned from Manchester. Oh, dear. Anyway. Oh, dear. All right, let's open it up to the floor now. I hope you guys are ready for these questions. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we'll start right. with, with you. Okay, uh, Messier, uh, one for you, Jeff. <coughs> yeah. I hear that you're currently playing and MDing for a Japanese band, and I heard that the Majority of the band speak very little or no English at all. So I was just wondering how you communicate with them and get round the language barrier. Well, basically, if they don't get the parts right, I make them commit Harry Curry. It's as simple as that, really. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, they, they, they can speak in a little bit of English. But, you know, once you present them, once you decide what the songs are going to be, then obviously they've learned the songs. And then in terms of arrangements, it's, uh, it's a case of just physically showing them what it is you want to, playing them what it is you want them to do. So it could be that I take something home and I splice it up together on, on Logic or something like that on my laptop. I bring it in the next day, I play it to them and they go, oh, yes, yes, Jeffson, yes, Jeffson. <laughs> and then we go and play it. So, you know, none of it is, uh, you know, it's all fairly straightforward, <laughs> you know. But uh, they're all, they're, you know, they're fantastic musicians. Um, they're brilliant at copying things. Absolutely brilliant at copying things. And uh, they're very, I mean, if you, you know, the, you've probably exam uh, experienced this, but the techs in Japan are incredible. You go there once and you come back the year, the next year, and everything's set up exactly yeah. as it was the year before. I it's mean, just it's like just England, incredible. Man. In fact, you know, I was staying in Japan one time and I left a pair of trainers in the hotel gym. I went back to that hotel two years later and they brought me the trainers when I arrived. Cleaned. Incredible, mm. incredible. But yeah, no, they're great. It's all great fun, and it's it's music's a universal language. You can you can work it with anybody, so it's it's all good. 
Have uh, Mike and Bob, you been in a similar situation? Well, every time you work with a band, they can't speak the same language as drummers anyway, so it makes no <laughs> difference, does it? They never understand what you're talking about. <laughs> well, a quarter note is a quarter note, and an eighth note is an eighth note, as long as you don't make the mistake of going around the world talking about quavers and, and crotchet. <laughs> as soon as you do that, you're in trouble. But interestingly enough, what Jeff was saying, um, every road crew has in Japan has a shadow road crew. So there, there's another load of guys that go with you and as soon as your road crew realize these guys are going to do the work they they're on holiday for a couple of weeks and they they do nothing at all it's their holiday these we we had a uh, i'm not sure if you want this but we had a we had an altercation in the kinks and we it, it all took place in a karaoke bar i won't go too far into it but the karaoke machine was kicked over and it, it looked, well, to me, it looked like it was absolutely finished. It was done for. And it was all broken in bits and everything. And the next, and the, the, the Shadow Road crew stayed up all night to mend it mm. with glue and everything. And they actually mended it. They probably made it better. They probably put a few, few other bits in it, didn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now it's digital. <laughs> the opposite. The America. Opposite. Yeah. I've seen the, when you work in America. And uh, it's time for tea breaks. That's it. The whole place shuts down. Yeah. And you are not allowed to touch anything. Nope. So you could be sitting there for like four or five hours going, uh, can someone get the drum kit riser in? It's like, no, it's tea no. break, union breaks. Yeah. Yeah. It's the stage, yeah. it's called no the stage to, goes dark. You don't, right. you don't no mess one, with them. You don't mess with them. <laughs> no one, your crew are not allowed to touch it. So if yeah. you hit it at the wrong time, that's it. That's you're, gigs you're, over. You just sit there. You, you, yeah, you just wait. It's just finished. <laughs> yep. So the badge had to represent what we what we are and what we do. So it's a combination of on it. It's, it's an on it badge. But in the in, in the badge, there's there's a there's a message to build and excel and to inspire and enhance. And that's exactly what you know our drums do. So people would ask, what makes a good drum? Well, it's it's everything that makes a good drum. And it's the small detail to from, from A to Z. It's it's the um, the timber type. It's it's the, it's the gluing of the timber, the, the cutting, uh, the lacquer, the edges, the lugs, the heads, um, the hoops. Everything goes together and, and makes that, that product. And if it's all good, you put. It's like baking. You get out what you put into it. You know all the good ingredients, and that so that's what makes a good drum. Uh, yeah, this is to everyone. Um, a lot of uh, drummers in the industry kind of uh, emphasize the importance of a network and networking. So how would you recommend building one from the ground up, basically? Don't all answer at once, guys. Who's, there, who's first? <laughs> okay. You want to go first, Mr. Henry? Well, so the thing, yeah, okay, I'll have a bash. Um, the thing about being, it's a given in the 21st century that you can play. Otherwise, you wouldn't be trying to get into, into the business. And, and everybody can. That's, that's the point. But the other thing about it is that you have to be a nice guy. And people don't want to... If you're a nasty piece of work, people don't want to employ you. And eventually, the business will, will spit you out. And networking is a natural consequence of being a nice guy and talking to people and being amenable. And if somebody wants you to, you know, if somebody wants you to do something to help then you, you need a really good excuse to not help them. You know, it's a question of putting yourself out. And that's what, for me, that's what networking is all about. I absolutely agree with, with, with what you just said, Bob. And I think it's something I said in one, to, I can't remember if I said it in every, all the classes today, but we've talked about this, the, this subject on numerous occasions. And I've always said it's, uh, to make it in this industry, it's probably about, 60 65 percent your ability and the rest is personality yeah um you know it's like i said you could be the best player in the world but if you're a complete jackass nobody mm. wants to work with you yeah nobody there wants is. to go on the road with somebody that it's not a fun person no to be no on the road absolutely with. not but there is another uh, part of that equation and it's lucky you know you, the, the adage is that that somebody is really lucky and it the people who are the luckiest people are the ones who work hardest at it that yeah. that's that's it yeah. in a nutshell yeah. i sort of Maybe because of the website and everything, maybe I've been more involved in that social media. And uh, um, to answer your question first, that's totally correct. You know, a lot of people I see in interviews and that they or people talk about various drums and they go, "Oh, they're just lucky." Um, and yes, we all are. Every single drummer, every lucky. single yeah. one of us is mm. lucky. But 
you really have to make your own luck. Mm -hmm. You know, if you just sit in your bedroom and you practice, um, as some of them that spoke to Gavin Harrison today as he was teaching said, you know, if you went and had 30 drum lessons with Billy Collieta and you don't practice, it means absolutely nothing. You've got to get out there. You've got mm -hmm. to go to jam nights, whatever it takes. You know, the industry is changing and there's nothing we can do about it, unfortunately. So we can sit and moan about it and we can bitch about it and go, oh, it's not like it used to be 10 years, but it's not going to make any difference. We can't. So, so I think that um, you need to be out there, okay? You make your own luck. Mm -hmm. um, totally correct. If you, you could be the greatest drummer and you go and get a gig, and if you're a pain in the backside, you're out of there. Um, cool. You know, I've been fortunate with a few of my students um, that have got big gigs, and um, you know, I've had a tough time. I remember Cherise getting a big gig with uh, Mika. Um, because at first she got the gig because she could play and she was a girl and she got that gig. That novelty wears off very, very quickly. If she couldn't cut the gig, mm. they would have just got someone else in. It's got nothing to do with her being a girl. It's got nothing to do with someone having no hair or brown hair or pink hair or whatever. If you can't cut the gig, you won't keep that gig. Mm. Management companies won't. Uh, but to go back to more to the question that you're asking, um, Netflix, net work is part of our industry. Um, and to go back to what, you, what I just said there about the industry's changed, the great thing about networking now is when I started, and I'm sure you, we needed record companies, mm. we needed promotion companies, we needed contacts with record labels, uh, radio yep. stations, you know, you were paying, paying, paying money for them to get your record onto radio shows. You, everything was, and it was all coming out of your budget. When now, social media, you can do that yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't. You don't necessarily need. I, I think I remember re, uh, hearing that Katy Perry got her album to number one by putting some social networking out on Twitter. She did no advertising, mm. nothing else. She put it out on Twitter. So that now means that social media is so important mm -hmm. because it's absolutely. now in our hands. And yeah, you know, we yeah. never had that. I mean, I haven't had the career these guys have had on a playing front. But you know, you don't. Back in those days, you were just putting out probably 70, 80% of what you're earning into promotion, record labels, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah. social media is, is now a huge part and it is actually an advantage for the younger generation to be part of it, whether you like it or not. I know there's some people go, oh, I'm not gonna ever do so, and that's fine, then don't do it, but it's important that we do social yeah. media. The, um, not to, well, I mean, it's all part of what you're saying, but you have to be prepared to work hard. And working hard may be isn't quite what you think it is. We, I don't know if Jeff did this, but we used to go to Germany and we would do nine 45 minute spots a night. Mm -hmm. And there would be 10 minutes off in between each 45 minute spot. And at the end of, you know, three, and, and that was until the last punter had left. So if that punter, there was one guy who was out of his brain. Uh, for uh, well, that was four o'clock in the morning. Yeah, no, well, I meant punter, <laughs> but it, you would be, you would have to, to play to him. So that was that was what we did, and that was what the gig became. And, and I spoke to Cozy about this. I said, did you, was it like that? Because Cozy went to to, um, Cozy to Germany. Cozy Powell, Didn't sorry, his full name. Yeah, Cozy Powell, and he went to Germany like we all did, and, and that was our way through, and it was that, that was our learning curve. You know, that, that was where we learned where the offbeat goes, and it actually doesn't go everywhere you think it, well, there's lots of places the offbeat can go, and, and that's what makes rock and roll, where, that, where you put that offbeat. But don't lose the point of the question. Uh, the point of the question is about networking. <laughs> yeah, but, but, but networking this, is This is my dad, I've got to keep an eye on you. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> so yes, networking, you have to. Yes. I think in synopsis, it's not going to come to you, you have to take yeah. yourself to it. Yeah, that's yeah. the bottom line it's of it. It's a big part of the industry. Isn't that what I said? Well, no, I got, we, we ended up with Cozy we, Cole, we I think, at one stage. No, we <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> right, we're going to have a, just a quick little break right now. Uh, we're actually going to go to Brent's hang. Now, uh, I should put out Brent's little bobblehead that we generally have on the table with us in these shows. It's not with us, but that's because... Uh, it's currently residing on a beach somewhere, so oh don't right. worry, Bob. It is, uh -huh. um, it is all taken care of. Uh, but over to you, Brent. 
Hey, Mike and Jill, it's good to see you guys again. I know you guys are thousands of miles away from here, but we're doing another hardware makeover today, and it's for a drummer named Joshua Berrios. He has a very unique setup. I dig it. I think you're going to dig it too. So let's get started. This has to be probably one of the more unique setups that I've seen recently, which is why I chose this one. He's actually using a Gibraltar rack, which is a three-sided rack, but the front part of the rack is actually a V-bar. Now on the left side, he's got his 12 and 13 inch snare. The 12 inch snare is below and the 13 inch snare is above. And these are both mounted to the rack. Now directly next to the 12 inch snare, which is on the bottom, is the 10 inch rack tom. Now the 10 inch rack tom is mounted about two inches higher than the snare so he can play everything on the same plane. He doesn't have to lift his hand up much. And this is splitting the space in between the 14 and the 12. Now just above the, the, the 10 inch tom we have his LP toys which is the jam block and the mountable tambourine. His left main crash and that is overshadowing our splash stacker and then right in front he has his hi-hats mounted. He's using a remote hi-hat and he's got his hi-hat placed right where most people place their rack tom, which is very cool because you don't have to worry about getting your hands crossed up and getting fouled up and sticks hitting each other. This is a very cool placement. So he's got his ride cymbal mounted directly over the bass drum, which is in a really perfect playing position. And it's mounted to its own stand that's also connected to the rack. Now he's got his right main crash, his right secondary crash, and his china on the far right. Now for his toms, he's got his 12 and 13 mounted like floor toms, which is awesome. The 12 inch tom is utilizing its own stand because he needs to place that as close to his main snare as possible. If you look, they're almost touching, literally. So he, li he only has to move his, his flip his wrist over about six inches. It's, it's brilliant, I love it, it's brilliant. So right next to the 12, he's got his 13 inch placed. So here it is, I done did it. Joshua, what do you think, man? Is it all right if I call you Josh? I feel like we're on the same wavelength now. Okay, I'll call you Joshua. So Joshua's setup has a number of different levels with drums and with cymbals intermixed. And sometimes with a rack, it's difficult to mount everything to one bar and put them on completely different levels easily. So we're keeping everything on a rack. We're doing two side racks, but we're making it two tiered. So I've got two legs on each foot, two legs in the front, two legs in the back. Now, what I did was I took 20 inch bars for the, for the upper tier, which is the outside, and I took a 20 inch bar and cut it in half, and I got two 10 inch bars for the lower tier on the inside. So this gives me that stair step type of look. The outside, I'm using a 46 inch curve bar for the upper tier, and on the inside, I'm using a 40 inch curve bar for the upper tier. Same thing for both sides. Now, let's start with the 12 inch. I got the 12 inch with a snare basket mounted directly to the bottom tier. The 13 inch snare drum, <clears throat> just made sense to put on the upper tier. Now the 10 inch tom, it, this one made sense too to mount off the bottom tier. So now let's go up to the percussion toys. I've got them separated mount, using their own mounts. I didn't have to do that, I just wanted to do that because I'm quirky like that. Joshua's got his mounted to one rod. So I, what I did was I took a cymbal, a cymbal down tube with a tilter and I mounted an L-arm in there and I used that for both, both the jam block and the mountable tambourine. Then we have our left main crash, which is mounted to the top tier of the crossbar. And then our splash stacker is actually mounted out of the front leg of the top tier. So I used an RBA to, to cap right over the end of the 20 inch bar. The front leg of the bottom tier, I'm using to mount my X hat. Yes, I know, you're calling me out right now because I don't have a remote hi-hat stand up here. But what can I do? We don't have a remote hi-hat stand, but we're working on one. So just bear with me on this. So I'm using an X-Hat. This is the SC4425 XHMB. Just imagine a cable coming from here. Next, we have our right side. Our ride cymbal is mounted over the bass drum directly out of the front short leg. Then I've got my right main crash mounted directly out of the back upper tier leg. And then my secondary right crash and my china are both mounted to the top back tier. Now I've got my two rack toms. I've got those mounted on the inside rack because I need them to be low. Now if you notice, on the left side, I mounted the lower tier rack bar on the inside of the legs. On the right side, I mounted the lower tier rack bar on the outside of the leg. I needed to get this 12 inch tom as close as I could to my main snare. So this made me get that extra inch and a half that I was grasping for. 
Now I've got the 13 mounted directly to the lower tier, which finishes out the kit. So what's really cool about this is that I still have tons of space where I can add more drums, more cymbals, and more accessories. I've got a part of the space left on my top tier and bottom tier on the left and right sides. So here are the product highlights for this month's hardware makeover. We have the Quick Release T-Leg Assembly, the SC GCS QC LT LA. It's a long run, I know. We have the SC GPR20, which is a 20 inch bar. We have the SC GPR46C, which is a 46 inch curve. We have a SC GPR40C, which is a 40 inch curve. And we have the SC GCRQT, which is the quick release T-clamp that allows us to add that extra leg on each of, the, each of the T legs. And we have a right angle clamp, which is the SC GCRA, which is what we're connecting all the crossbars to the verticals with. And then we also have the SC 4425XHMB, which is our um, makeshift remote hi-hat stand, which is actually our X-hat. Well, that's this week's Brent Hang for you guys. We'll see you next time. Right, thank you for that, Brent. Uh, now, Jeff, I know you have a question for these yes, two. I'm going to let do. you have that go oh, now. I do, oh, dear. Something that's been brewing in my mind for a long time. <laughs> oh, I've known these gentlemen. Really? Bob, so, so I want in the, uh, to know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> what was it like having Mike work for you? And Mike, what was it like working for Bob? You go I mean, first. Well, what you're talking about is when I worked for Bob as oh, a yeah, sax I had a, yes. I had a drum Sorry. shop. Sorry. Bob, from uh, 1977 yeah. to 1982, we lasted for five whole years. It was a very good drum shop. It was, yeah. It, it, it was everything store. I wanted a drum shop to be, except making money. <laughs> I thought you were going to say having Mike. Mike was working for I said yeah. that out loud. <laughs> no, Mike was the... Interestingly enough, Mike was the Saturday boy, so he came he on a Saturday. He was 13 years old, by the he way. Was he was 13 and he came up from Brighton every Saturday. Now, I'm not sure whether we paid him um, no, you didn't. in you decimal me. money or in <laughs> five shillings and six. You owe me money. <laughs> but anyway, he, he used to go away with, uh, I don't know, five shillings. Well, so let's su suggest he got two or three quid. Nothing. He didn't get much more than that. And he had to go all the way back to Brighton. But he brought his, his dad up with him. So... His dad had to come, so they had to buy two tickets. Be careful what you say, because you know he's offended. When I know he gets offended very easily by, said, by that. I'm not going to go there. Book. I'm not going to go there. It's all in the book, by the way. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> plug, plug. <laughs> but uh, it, I didn't go in a lot on, on a Saturday when Mike was there, but when I did, he was a really good kid. Was I? You were. Well, what, what happened is, is he wanted to be a drummer. And his old man said, yeah, you can be, be a drummer, drummer providing you learn the business from the ground up. And so he came to Henrik's drum store and started going up, didn't you? Yeah, well, we made him it's, what it's he is almost today. true. And it, on a serious note, if you do want to know more about it, you should read Bob's, Bob's book, because I do make several appearances in this. You do? Book. But I was 13 years old, and my dad, uh, we used to go up to the International Music Show which mm. was an old music show that used to take place at Olympia, wasn't it? Well, it used to be in Russell Square. Did in it? The Russell Hotel, yeah. Well, I can't, no, this wouldn't have been Russell Square then because my, I remember my dad apparently went on a, the Pearl train. Oh, the, yeah, that was at Olympia. Olympia yeah, and he met was, Jerry, Jerry Evans. He did meet okay? Jerry, yeah. And apparently he said to it, Jerry Evans, look, my son, you know, I was doing some playing at this stage mm -hmm. and he said, my mm -hmm. son's serious and I want him to, as, as Bob's just said, he said, can I get him a job? So Jerry Evans being... The guy he was was like, yep, cheap labour. Brilliant. <laughs> See, now that he's making this up. <laughs> Am I really? Anyway, so uh, my dad used to bring me up because for those that don't know, Henry's Drum Store used to be in Wardour Street. True, yeah. Two doors up from the marquee. Yep. But on one side of the road was happening. On the other side of the well, I could look, see how you want to look at this. On mm. the other side of the road was the red light district, Soho. My mum was not going to let me come up to London <laughs> at 13 years old. So or, or your dad. Or my, well, I don't know. But you reckon my dad used to disappear. But anyway. I wondered where he went for, for eight hours. And you did put this in the book and I he was did. very offended because <laughs> he said he used to make fixed drums for you downstairs. He did. So anyway, Henry's Drum Store was, was an amazing, amazing shop. It really was. It was an Aladdin's cave. Mm. There was an incredible hire department. There were some amazing characters. I honestly Ooh. don't really remember Bob um, because Bob was out touring. I was. I mean, at the time, Bob was... With Don McLean, so I was never there. Je Jeff Dugmore <laughs> at the time. And uh, all I remember Bob was... I remember two things. 
I remember red kickers. Yep. You always wore red kickers, and I don't know which son it was, but the, whoever it was with the James. little teddy bear. Yeah. And uh, but there's fuzzy a, bear. Fuzzy bear was it? Yeah. Fuzzy bear was left on a red bus, and when and they the family were coming to drum store, and James got to drum store and suddenly realised that he'd left fuzzy bear on the bus. And Mike went and got it, didn't you? Well, I remember there was a couple of things that wow. I loved about Henry's drum store. And one was Fuzzy um, Bear. Well, one was hanging out with Zach Starkey. Because yeah. at the time, Zach, who was Ringo Starr's son, Zach was always in the shop because mm. the Who offices were above us. I mean, this was an amazing location, wasn't it? So the it Who was. offices were above it us. It was absolutely rock and roll. And Zach mm. was always in the shop. He was the same age as me. He might be a year younger than me. He had the biggest Mohican. Do you remember? He did, yeah. Ever and um, we used to just chat. I mean, at the time, I know this is hard to believe, but the Beatles weren't cool then, were they? They weren't as cool as no, they, they are now. No, they, yeah. And so Zach used to talk to me about Ringo, and for those that don't know, Zach's godfather was Keith Moon. Mm -hmm. So I remember Zach very clearly because of that Mohican, mm. uh, and we stayed in contact for uh, quite a bit. And I also remember sitting outside the shop one day, I got there early. I think I might have been a little bit older because I think. I was allowed to come up on my own by this Were stage, you? yeah. And I was sitting outside, you know, and big black Rolls Royce pulled up and window wound down. I went, hey kid, what time's the shop open? It's like, oh, oh 10 o'clock. Okay, and the window rolled up and it just stayed there. And then when the shop opened, it was David Essex <laughs> got out. And, <laughs> and he was the first person that I actually said, oh, can, can I have your signature? And they pulled me into the shop and said, Ooh. don't ever. Never do that, and which I actually really? learned from then onwards. He said, you know, this is a cool shop. You do not go up and have, you know, you, we didn't fo do selfies in those days, but you don't go in and get signatures or anything like that. So from then onwards. <laughs> <laughs> David Essex was a drummer, by the way. Yeah. I think he bought a book, Kit for his son, though, if I remember right. He did in the end, yeah. That's the yeah. only thing I remember. But anyway. It's a great one um, like yours. It was yeah. good. It, we lasted, I lasted there for about four years. Yeah. Five years, mm -hmm. and I did every single job possible there. To do. And, yeah. and some yeah. that uh, we won't be talking about, Well, will we? the Santana <laughs> one was pretty cool. I went with the old Steve Gadd, who mm, was, I, Steve was Gad. Nick and McBrain's John Tech. He ran the hire department, and I remember going to Easy Hire, which is now Easy John hire, Henry's. Yeah. Which is now John Henry's, and I was just you know, I was just a kid, and I remember the, we pulled up and we were delivering some stuff, and there was this incredible sound coming out one of the studios. I'm like, wow, what's going on in there? They went, oh, it's this guy, Carlos Santana. Do you want to go and have a look? I didn't have a clue who Carlos Santana was. I'm like, yeah. And I know, I swear I'm not exaggerating here. I was this close, sitting on the floor with my legs crossed, looking at this guitarist who was here. I had no idea who it was. Now There's I'm like, idea. oh my God, it was Carlos Santana. <laughs> what? I would have got a selfie, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, did you ask for his autograph? <laughs> no, he's too busy playing Black Magic, Magic Woman, Woman. Yeah. yeah. Who was the drummer? So, um, a yeah, Barry. Graham Lear. Oh, was it? Graham Lear was playing okay. drums back in those days. Sorry, wow. there you go. That's all right. You've answered his question. Yeah. Yes, thank yeah. you very much. Did you ever come in the shop? I did. When I came, one of the first times I came to London, I, I, uh, I can't remember, sort of late 70s, probably something like that. Mm. And I did come into the shop mm. and I remember sort of looking around and being completely sort of it's like a kid in a candy yeah. shop, you know, mm. it was just, an, it was amazing. It was incredible, all the stuff that was in there and obviously Bob's name, it was like mm. a household name for drummers. And uh, I just th remember thinking, I've got to go, I've got to go to this shop, I've got to go to this shop. And it's, and it's right next door to the marquee. I'm going to see both of these yeah. things at the yeah. same time. Well, Trident Studios was just around the Yeah, it's it was. now it's a photocopy shop, isn't it? Uh, I don't know what it, no, drum, the drum store is a photocopy yeah, shop. Yeah, photocopy shop, yeah. But I look, I was up there recently and i've not believe it or not i've not been able to go past drum store i've actually taken a half mile detour rather than go down that bit of wardour yeah. street and yeah, it looks stupid. the same doesn't it the, the, the shop is the same well is that yeah. because of sort of the memory of it or yeah i guess so you know i mean it, it was a it, it failed you know and I, I i did i just you know i was very unhappy that it failed and mm. uh, so i never I never went by it again. And so somebody raised it from your I was memory trying to, yeah, so I think so, yeah. yeah. Then Mike talked about it. Well, um, there is a nice bit, actually. I always remember the final part of this story. Over the top as you came in, over right. the top of the wall, Keith Moon, had, if, if I remember rightly, he'd written, keep it up. It said keep it keep up. Keep it yeah. up, Keith Moon. Right over the top of the wall as you came in, it was brilliant. But he just, I don't know how he wrote it, because it looked like a 
big black He probably mark jumped up and did a K right, and then okay. jumped up again and did no, a yeah, right, What was he written with? <laughs> oh, yeah. What was it? Because there wasn't Sharpies yeah, there, there, was there, were, there, was there, there were. Of anyway, there were. of course, when the photocopying shop, or when it went bust, I said to Bob, what happened to that? I think they, they came in and painted over it. <sighs> yeah, so yeah, under they that, they probably will never know that underneath that was well, keep, I, keep it up. I looked, keep when I was up there, I, I went in the ship as well, and the ship oh, is not God, what yeah. it used to be. It's, yeah. it's not, I mean, it used to be a rock and roll pub. Yeah. Now it's a pub. And yet, the one pub in London that could be a rock and roll pub for, with genuinely doesn't have any, any memorabilia, nothing at all. Well, the red light district's not the same as it used to be either, but we'll move no. on very We're going to move on. <laughs> and, on that, and on that note... I wouldn't know about that, but uh, you are Sorry. pretty good. <laughs> on that note, we're going to go back to the audience now before okay. that goes into okay. areas we don't need good to question. discuss. Uh, we'll, we'll go with you. Hi, uh, yeah. Uh, just a question, general one, because I feel there's so many great drummers out there who seem to have started really young. I was wondering, if, is there any... Uh, way that somebody older could start, and how is it too late to to start? No. It's never too late. It's never, too it's late. late. never too late. Never too late. Well, I it personally, would be good to give you chapter and verse on it, but I don't think I, can I would really. like to just say that oh, as, yeah, a, can. as an educator, um, I think that why we play the drums is that you just get something. It's like a drug. You just play the drums, and that enjoyment of playing the drums. I still get a buzz out of it, you know, and I, I think that a lot of older people who have maybe got a certain stage in their life, especially probably our generation, who couldn't do it when they were younger, okay, for whatever reasons, their parents didn't want them to do it or, you know, whatever it might be, and they've got to a stage financially in their, their lives where maybe the kids have moved on and they now take up the drums and therapy for a start. I think they come home from a hard day. I think every, we all know... You know, life is getting harder for everybody. They come home, it's, it's great therapy. If they can get together with some of their mates, and it doesn't, it really makes no difference how good you are. You know, yeah. it's about the enjoyment, enjoyment you yeah. get out of the yeah. drums. I yeah. still, even now, I want to, I need to play my drums every day. Mm -hmm. You know, and I don't play it for any other reason except, ah, oh, you know what? It's like a, this feels great. Yeah. Yeah. So, no, I think any strings any, any go any right out of the window as soon as you start playing. It's not an age thing. Yeah. Totally not. Absolutely. I mean, you're the oldest one, Bob, by a long way. So, I mean, what Thank do you think? Why? <laughs> 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 yeah, it, uh, hey, I can, I can take this. I love the band of the I love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I am not. I am over 21. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's funny, really, because um, we're not talking about age. So, I'm celebrating I, the third anniversary of the 21st. <laughs> third? <laughs> it's five. Oh anyway, carry on, sorry. Yeah, thanks. Uh, it's not my turn, is it? Yeah, it is. Oh, is it? You've got the question, question, don't you? <laughs> Give us a question again. Oh, yeah, no, yeah. Uh, okay. There you go. <laughs> I'll do anything to get a laugh, obviously. Um, I, I don't, I mean, I started ever so early, and I'm guessing that... That, that Jeff did, did you? What, what age did you start? Oh, uh... <laughs> <laughs> Compose yourself. Mike, how about you right, answer okay. that question? <laughs> I was, uh... 11 when I got my right. first drum set. Yeah. But I was playing cardboard boxes with knitting yeah, needles when I was three. Did, did you have a washboard? Like I've got one. No, but I've got one now. Yeah, I have as well, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't think age is anything to do with it. I think, that, I think aspiration is the thing that's to do with it. And I don't believe people take up playing football or playing tennis so that they can be a champion. They, they take it up because they want to do it and it's fun mm. and they enjoy it. Absolutely and it's the same with drumming. And of course, if you're going to take up drumming at an advanced age, I'm guessing it's not for you, it's for somebody else. Are you asking this question for somebody else? Um, no. Just, just oh, right. I was being facetious, but <laughs> I think. But um, it, it isn't about age at all. And probably coming to it later in life, you might actually be more inclined to learn the rudiments than you were, than you would have been as a, a, a young kid. When because young kids get involved, and they, a lot of it is, is, is thrashing around because uh, that's that's good. Yeah, and that's that's what you want though. You want to yeah, put a that's song what you've and got play to do. music. Yeah. That's what you mm -hmm. want. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. But the other thing I is, agree with you. The, one of the other things that people never talk about. I mean, there's a lot of bedroom players. But it's all about being in a band. 
it's it's about playing with other musicians mm -hmm. and interaction. It, it is, yeah. but sometimes that opportunity is not there, is it? No, but if it's True. not there, we, we used, there was a strand on on Dolbear.com about somebody was desperate to I get a website. jam night going, and there weren't any near him. And the obvious the answer to it is well, do your Start own your, one, yeah. Yeah. do it yourself. So. Um, this, this guy didn't actually get it. I, oh, I don't know what happened to him. Do you remember that? No, there was a, there was a lot of traffic on, on it. Forum, I don't. don't read it. Well, I do read it, but I <laughs> that was That was another facetious <laughs> thing. You'll be cutting that out. But, um, <laughs> we were cutting anything out. That's the unfortunate <laughs> thing, including your age. Yeah. Well, I haven't said anything. I just said over 21. And anyway, everybody knows I'm nearly But, but nearly no, if you answer that question, anyone should play the drums. And I recommend that everybody plays the drums. If it I makes you feel better, he's trying to make me learn the drums at the moment. He's been trying to make me learn for years. <laughs> <laughs> but it is therapy as well. I mean, uh, as, 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 as <laughs> No, I don't want to be rude like you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, Remo was very big on the whole wellness uh, theory and uh, playing drums made you well. Mm. Uh, and according to Remo, it really, really no, did. I think there's a lot something of success. there. I mean, I, I do believe there is something there. It's just, it, you know, if you feel good about anything, whatever it is you do, uh, surely you've got to be in a better place. So I, I would imagine if you are suffering from some form of depressions or, or stressful days at work or whatever, if, it, if you can get behind the drum kit and it makes you feel good, if you could put on a, whatever your favourite music is, you know, Back in Black or whatever, and you come out going, oh, then it's got to have some, some goodness there. Um, anyway. Okay, cool. Amen. 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 Oh,